This is not and will not be America's fight alone. Our job is to find enough common ground. Yeah, I'm a kid from Akron, Ohio. Make history. Why does it I had no knowledge. I'm running for president. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Did you hear that music? Did you like that? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was written by my son, who's sitting right over there. So thank you there. Zach Seekoff, remember the name. Okay. Thank you and welcome to the HuffPo Show. I am Roy Seekoff, and we are coming to you live from our LA studio. Uh, we've got a great show for you tonight. Comedy legend Carl Reiner is in the house. Yes. Yes. So is musician and filmmaker Praz Michel. And we have a very funny lady, Parks and Rec's Retta. But first, we want to kick things off like we always do with This Week In, This Week In. Our look at some of the fanatics, fools, morons, and miscreants who caught our attention this week. First up, this week in 19 hypocrisies and counting. <laughs> the fallout from the Josh Duggar child, child molestation scandal continued to spread with examples of hypocritical behavior piling up faster than home pregnancy tests in Michelle Duggar's trash can. <laughs> Leading the hypocrisy parade is Duggar family patriarch, Jim Bob Duggar. Yes, who upon learning that his then 14-year-old son had molested one of his young sisters, decided to do absolutely nothing about it. Yeah, why? Maybe it was because he was in the midst of running for the United States Senate and had argued on his campaign website that incest should be punishable by death. Wow. Whoops. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when Josh Duggar decides to rebel against his dad, he really goes for it. <laughs> Yeah. Even when he learned that his son had continued to molest his sisters, Jim Bob chose to deal with the problem by sending his son to a treatment program that turned out to be nothing more than working at the home remodeling business run by a family friend. By the way, there's a lot of rumors around this story, but we can put to rest one. There's no truth to the rumor that TLC was looking to do a spin-off home makeover series starring Josh. <laughs> Yeah. You tune into that, right? Uh, but the Duggars' steaming pile of hypocrisy doesn't end there. Last year, Jim Bob abruptly withdrew his endorsement of a candidate in Arkansas when he learned that the guy had once been kids, cover your ears, the lawyer for a lingerie store. Yeah. So while Josh's secret was forgivable, apparently Victoria's secret wasn't. <laughs> Now, Jim Bob's wife, Michelle, served up a similar double standard in 2014 when she recorded a robocall urging people to protest the bill that would let transgender people use whichever bathroom they felt more comfortable in. Michelle immediately played the child predator card. I don't believe the citizens of Fayetteville would want males with past child predator convictions that claim they are female to have a legal right to enter private areas reserved for women and girls. We should never place the preference of an adult over the safety and innocence of a child. So think about the chutzpah it takes to sound the alarm about imagine transgender child predators 12 years after covering up for an actual trial, child predator in your own family. Wow. Ah, but the Duggar clan is not the only group with a Duggar problem. <laughs> it seems that almost every Republican presidential candidate has spent time cozying up to now admitted child molester Josh Duggar, who, until the scandal broke, had been the head lobbyist for the Family Research Council. That's a conservative Christian group that has been at the forefront of the fight against gay rights, against abortion rights, and even the ability to get divorced. Sinners! <laughs> now, one of the candidates with the closest ties to Duggar is Rick Santorum, who famously compared homosexuality to pedophilia and bestiality, 
and who has been effusive in his praise for the Duggars over the years, recently saying that he and his wife had been inspired by this, quote, amazing family that had raised their children in a faith-filled home filled with a fun, loving spirit. Because really, what says faith and fun more than hiding an incest scandal to keep your TV ratings up? <laughs> the Duggars have returned the affection, starring in a 2012 campaign video that they called 19 Reasons to Vote for Rick Santorum. Senator Rick Santorum will fight for small businesses and bring American jobs back home. He is a daddy and he loves his children. When Santorum was asked about the scandal earlier this week, he had this to say. I'm just sickened by it. Um, I, I, I pray for those girls in particular. To have gone through that is uh, just hard to think about. Now, notice that he said that he was sickened by the revelation, but not by the fact that the family he'd found so amazing had millions of dollars in their pockets presenting themselves as holier than the rest of us long after knowing that their kid was a child molester. Now, Santorum's step away from the Duggars leaves just one GOP candidate all alone on Duggar Island. Yep, old Mike Huckabee, <laughs> who has openly defended the family, saying that Josh and his family were, quote, honest and open with the victims and the authorities. Now, this would be absolutely 100% true if you define being honest and open as covering up a series of sex crimes and refusing to allow the authorities to question their son. <laughs> of course, this isn't the first time that Mike Huckabee has sided with the sexual predator. As governor of Arkansas, he once lobbied for the release of a man convicted of raping a 17-year-old cheerleader because he had been convinced that the rapist had experienced a religious conversion in prison. The man, Wayne Dumont, repaid Huckabee's support by raping and murdering a 39-year-old woman almost as soon as he was set free. Yeah, so that's sexual predation one, Jesus' redemptive power, zero. <laughs> <laughs> then there is Huckabee's chummy embrace of Ted Nugent, a man who has demonstrated a lifelong obsession with underage girls. It, I, it could have been whiskey, it could have been drugs, but no, I was a wang-dang addict. I mean, I was addicted to girls. Addicted. It was hopeless. It was beautiful. <laughs> there is no punchline for that. But this is the same Mike Huckabee who recently attacked the president and Michelle Obama for letting their daughters listen to Beyonce, calling her work mental poison. So, yes, as far as Mike Huckabee is concerned, covering up for a child molester is fine, as long as you don't let him listen to Crazy in Love. <laughs> now, if you find Huckabee's stances on who should and shouldn't be forgiven confusing, don't feel bad. Everybody here at the HuffPost show felt the same way, which is why we have created an easy-to-follow Will Mike Huckabee Forgive You flowchart. <laughs> Gentlemen? <laughs> Yes, it's very simple. All you have to do is ask yourself one question. Did you commit a crime? If the answer to this is no, you say, am I the first family? If the answer to that is yes, you then say, Beyonce, do you let your kids listen to the music? If the answer to that is yes, the answer is, huh, no. Mike Huckabee will not be forgiving you. However, if to the question, did you commit a crime, and the questions, was it a sex crime? Did it involve underage girls? If the answer to those is yes, you then have to ask yourself, are you a conservative rock star? Are you a Christian reality TV star? Or are you someone who has had a Christian jailhouse conversion? If the answer to any of these is yes, then hallelujah! Mike Huckabee will definitely forgive you. What's more, 
He may even join you in a rousing on-air rendition of Cat Scratch Fever or Wang Dang Sweet Poontang. <laughs> Wang dang, sweet. Do I have to pay royalty on that? Anyway, uh, <laughs> after all that, I feel like I kind of need to take a shower. But no time for that, because one of the great writer, producers, and directors of all time, responsible for some of the funniest TV shows and movies of the last 50 years, is here with us. So let's take a look at his work. If I've asked you this many times. You've asked me a lot of junk. Yes. Give me a good hand. Good one. That's the way I like to feel a good handshake. You were born in Darling Falls, Montana. Darling Falls, Montana, June 12, 1922. Is that right, Al? Mr. Hiker, yeah. you've written this remarkable book on taxes entitled The Agony and the Ecstasy. Yeah. Now, isn't that a, a strange title since uh, Mr. Irving Stone has used that title for his book on Michelangelo? Ellis? <laughs> Out of business. Your book's going to be a television series? It's true. Of course, I won't do it until after my series is defunct, which may never be. Buongiorno. Buongiorno. But uh, she still got bad breath, but he don't care. This is the kind of music that tells me to go out there and be somebody. Our body. It's my body. I'm not sharing my body with anyone. Everybody's going to be real disappointed. <sighs> Where are we going? God damn, your drunk tests are hard. Gotta leave a magnolia loop of time. What's her name? You're the elevator killer. Merv Griffith. Yeah. Why? I don't know. I've always just loved to kill. I've really enjoyed it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. Please join me in welcoming a man who has given me more pleasure than almost anyone other than my wife, one of the comedy icons of the last 50 years, Carl Reiner. <laughs> so good to have you. Let me, let me just do this. I'm so, I'm so happy to have you here, sir. Bless you, my Bless son. Me. Thank you. Let me touch your hair. That's real hair. Good stuff, right? I have that in I, boxes at home. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> But you were you were on the vanguard of the bald thing. Well, you know the thing about baldness is that there was a guy named Fred McMurray who wore a toupee, and I never wore a toupee. Fred, at, that was a toupe. Yeah, oh, and I, I never wore a toupee walking around the street. And he said, "How do you decide when to wear it?" I said, "Well, if I put on a tuxedo and I want to be well dressed and a little handsomer than I am, I wear a toupee." <laughs> But every time I wore it on the Carson show or any of the shows I was on, I always told the audience, you know, this is a toupee. I didn't want to fool them, just want to look good, that's all. I, ne I never lied about it. Now, you, you have been on a tear. You have been on a writing tear. This is just the last <laughs> two years. Yeah, two and a half yeah, years. You've written uh, three volumes of your memoirs. Right. Uh, I Remember Me. Uh, I Just Remembered. <laughs> And what I forgot to remember. Right. That's now, so, by the way, let me, I'm so I'm so proud of this for a different reason. First of all, this book has three, 230 pictures in it. So people who don't like to read as much as they like to look at pictures, <laughs> this is their book. <laughs> anyway, no, the the pictures are fill in. But this picture, this photo, I am so proud of. My wife, who passed away a few years ago. We were married for 65 years, but we met and married while I was in the Army, and she came to visit me in Camp Crowder, Missouri, and painted this watercolor portrait of me. Now, if you know anything about paintings, watercolors is not the f medium for, for portraits. Yeah. You make a mistake, you can't repair it. You have to throw it out. One sitting, about an hour and a half, I don't know if you got to take a look yeah. closer to that. That yeah. is, that's what I look like then. This is the way I look now. The same. <laughs> uh, for those of you who don't know, his wife Estelle, uh, along with being a fantastic singer, she's the lady in the famous orgasm scene in When Harry Met Sally, she says, I'll have what she's having. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, 
in all of these books, wh wh why so prolific? Why are you on this tear? Is there is there a reason? I don't know. It, it they're in at this age. I'm an 80. No, no. 93, I'm, sir. 93 in a at, <laughs> yeah, in, in two months. There's very little I can do, but I do love the computer and I do love to write. When I learned that I could write, I didn't know I was a writer until one day I wrote a short story in the basement of my apartment in a house in New Rochelle. I brought it to my wife and I was a teletype operator in the Army. I wanted to see if I could still type. She said, where'd you get this? I said, I wrote it. She said, you wrote this? She was laughing. So I wrote 13 of them. I wrote 13 short stories. I gave it to a gentleman. And I, who gave it to another gentleman who asked me if I'd have lunch with him. My friend was a, a textile manufacturer, and this guy was in pocketbooks. I think he bought textiles for the pocketbooks. Yeah. No, he was Simon and Schuster pocketbooks. And, oh. he's, and he's the one who said to me, short stories don't sell, but uh, novels do. And I said to my wife, I can't write a novel. I don't have enough words. I went to college at Georgetown for one year. I don't have enough. She says, you may not have enough words, but you have feelings. And with that, I started to write Enter Laughing, my first novel. Well, there's some amazing stories in here. I mean, there's stories about Billie Holiday and Frank Sinatra and the Rosenbergs. Yeah. Do you have a favorite story in, in What I Forgot to Remember? Let me see. I'll look at the uh, chapters. <laughs> no, it's, no the, the, they're all my favorite stories. Uh, oh, oh, my God. Carol uh, Burnett. There's good uh, pictures. you got to get the pictures. Oh, well, while yeah. you're looking at that, you know, I noticed that the foreword was written by Bill Maher. Yes. And the foreword over here was written by Jerry Seinfeld, and this one by Billy Crystal. Right. Obviously, they all idolize you as a comedy icon. What do you feel about the current comedy scene? Do you like it? Do you think it's... Uh... Well, there are th some. There are some. There always will be the commentators. The one who comment... The, the comedians who commentate on what's going on, they're funny. I mean, Louis, Louis C.K. C.K. is yeah. funny. And... God bless Billy Crystal and uh, J uh, Josh Gad. They got this new program. Yeah. It is wonderful. I, t I tweet that to, so people will watch it. <laughs> now, Billy Crystal is a phenomena. He did a show called 700 Sundays. He did it for years. It's the most brilliant piece of one-man showmanship I've ever seen. Now, you mentioned Twitter, and it got a laugh, but actually, you are incredibly active <laughs> on the Twitters. I love Twittering. What do you love about the, about the platform? I, I, it's you're talking to people. I'm 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 all, I can't go anyplace anymore. I'm I don't I walk around a block. That's about it. Can't get in a plane anymore because most of the cities you come to, my bed isn't there. My bed is it's in on Rodeo Drive, and <laughs> and so I'm I'm a stick in the mud. I I have one good friend, Mel Brooks, who comes over every night. We watch television. And Mel who? Mel Brooks. Brooks. I, short, I've heard of that fellow. Yeah, short, yeah. Short Jewish man. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the 2,000-year-old man. Th that was an interesting story. Me I met Mel when he was about 21 years old. I was about 25. He was a friend of Sid Caesar's, not working on the show. And he came to visit once. And the first day I was there, this man stands up and he starts to uh, say he was a, uh, a, a pirate, a Jewish pirate. <laughs> and I'll never forget the first lines. He says... You know, he says, I can't set sail anymore. I can't afford to set sail. He says, you know what they're charging for sail cloth? Four dollars a yard. I can't afford to pillage and rape anymore. <laughs> the first words I heard from him. And then, Those first words out of Mel Brooks's mouth. Yes. And the following day I came in, there was a program called We the People Speak. And I said, that's a good program to satirize. And I, I said to Mel, Here's a man who was actually at the scene of the crucifixion 2,000 years ago. <laughs> Is that true, sir? And he went, oh, boy. I <laughs> says, you knew Jesus? He says, thin lad, right? He walked around with 12 other guys, sandals they wore. He says, they came into the store all the time, asked for water. I gave it to them. They were nice guys. Never bought anything. That was the first line. That was the beginning of it. And then for the next 10 years at parties, when it was dull anywhere, we'd get up and, and do it. And it took 10 years to get it on record. And then it blew up. Yes, it blew. Now, you also recently tweeted, it blew yes. up. Up. Yes. Yes. Because that has a new meaning now. Yes. Right. Yeah, right. Right. But now, you tweeted about, about Tina Fey. Yes. Uh, when she was on Letterman, you said, last night on The Letterman Show, Tina Fey was beautiful and brilliant as always. Yes. Tell us about your love of Tina Fey. Well, the first time I saw her was she was on Saturday Night Live and she did an impersonation of Miss Palin. And I fell over. It was so accurate. She does, she has two things, as I said. 
she's brilliant and beautiful. Yeah. And she was on, what was she on lately? Uh, uh, on Well, she did 30 Rock, right? Which I think owes a huge debt to the Dick Van Dyke show. <laughs> well, that is a good show, by the way. But, no, she just <laughs> retired her... her oh, she was on Letterman and took off her dress? dress. Yeah, she stripped down? She retired. Yes. She, and she's still sexy. You know, it's, <laughs> it's interesting. We're... St do you think it's strange that that here in 2015 we're still having a conversation, women being funny? Do you know there's still this 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 question about it? Well, uh, you know it's funny. I was married to a woman who was funny. She wasn't a comedian. She was the most gifted person I know. I say about her that Estelle raised three great kids and one great husband. I was seven or eight years younger than she was when we met. We married 65 years later. Everything I know, but she was always funny. She always the button when she said, "I'll have what she's having." There was one time when my daughter was 16, and Robbie, who was two years older, her brother, he was saying, "What do you want for your birthday?" Oh, we were saying, "What do you want?" And he said, "Why don't you get a nose job, job like your friends are?" They all had little bumps on their noses, and I said, "Wait a minute, Rob." I says, "Her mother has a bigger nose than that, and look at the handsome guy she got." And, and my wife says, yes, it's not the size of your nose that counts, it's what's in it. <laughs> and it's funny, I was, doing, I was doing the jerk with Steve Martin at the time. Yeah. I told him out, he laughed hysterically. Ten years later, he calls Estelle, and he says, Estelle, you know that line you said about the nose? I'm doing Cyrano, I'd like to use it. And in Cyrano, you see Steve Martin say, it's not the nose that counts, it's what's in it. And, <laughs> Fantastic. You know, looking at that uh, compilation at the beginning, you've been involved in so many great things. Uh, I hope you don't mind if we touch on a few. No, no, no. Touch. Obviously, the touchstone, the talisman, yeah. maybe one of the great television shows ever, The Dick Van Dyke Show. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Now, this is one of the best things that could happen as a, uh, to get a question like that because I left here close my computer, I'm on page 52 of a book that is called The Who, Here, What, and How the Dick Van Dyke Show Came to Be. It's going to be the... Everything that Carl Reiner knows about the Dick Van Dyke Show. About everything that's ever happened on the show. And every time I look at the 158 chapters, I say, oh, my God, that what happened there, what happened there, what happened with Mary four or five times. I mean, it, it's, it's, my, it's my labor of love right now. What's interesting about the show, so it, it's... In some ways, very inside show busy, right? It takes place on a show like your show of shows. And yet, it stood the test of time. What about it do you think has spoken to so many generations? I know, I know exactly what it was. I wrote about the one thing I knew about my wife and I, our relationship, and our relationship to our kids and the world. And we wrote about that. And if you talk about yourself and you're honest about it, most people say, that's just like me. And another thing I did, was I was very careful about that. When other writers came in, I said, don't use... I knew we had something special. I said, I have a feeling this show is going to be around. I knew it. I said, so let's not use any slang of the day. No, a gun is a gun, not a gat. Uh, no, the words of the day were... I mean, the slang words were from the, from the picture of, or McMinnville, or they had a lot of... They didn't last. No, it didn't last. Yeah, because I have no idea what that means. Yeah, no. But, uh, you, McMinnville. Yeah, yeah, the, from, the, from the story about the same name, that was a big thing. Yeah. But, uh, and, and, and if you list, watch the Van Dyke show, there's no, there's no slang in it. And, uh, and, and another thing, uh, people haven't changed that much. I decided to love to do sh to about, uh, shows about two people who were meant to be together and wanted to be together. They were not uh, two against each other. Yeah. They were two against the world. I, I used Lucy, who was the, probably the best comedian ever lived, but her show was about two people, two people who shouldn't have been together. <laughs> right, right. They're always fighting. Yeah. Now, you also have another uh, thing that you are the only man... Yes. ...who ever... <laughs> I can't wait to hear this. Leave that hanging, right? The suspense. Yes, yes. ...who has been on every incarnation of The Tonight Show. That's right. From Steve Allen to Jack Barr to Johnny Carson, Jay Leno, <laughs> Jimmy Fallon. Yes. I was, I was, I was on Carson. There was another show with the, the, the Jerry Lester show, even before that. But on the Carson show, I was on 47 times, and it was last week, 
He invited me to come and say goodbye. And I said, Johnny, you got to do me a favor. I said, in my resume, I want to be able to say I was on 50 times, 47. Is, so I said, would you introduce me three times? And he did. <laughs> I walked out. He gave me that intro. I had one. I walked out. I turned my jacket inside out. And he's here. And I walked. I sat down, cut. I walked out again. I came with the jacket over my shoulder. So I got 50 shots. 50 shots. <laughs> yeah. <Nice>. So. <laughs> There's been a lot of upheaval in late night this year, yeah, obviously, right. with the retirements. Yeah. What, what, what do you think of the current state? Are, do, you know, it seems to have taken a turn towards the silly. Yeah. Uh, you know, Jimmy Fallon is, uh, you know, cracking eggs on his head yeah. or doing lip sync battles. Yes, yeah. It's not kind of the banter from, from the Jack Parr days. Are, are you a fan of, of the current state of late night? You know, the funny thing is I am. First of all, Jimmy Fallon, I think, is a, what a, a, an amazing talent. He sings, he does everything, and he takes chances. He's not afraid. Kimmel, same thing. But the guy I really am, I, who's a, sort of making the, the, he, that kind of a show a different show is James Corden, the Englishman. Yeah. He's unbelievable. Yeah. He's, he sings, he dances, he, he did a, he was on a, a runway with models. He was sensational. Yeah. He is very graceful and he sings beautifully. We saw him on Broadway in, uh, you know, uh, One Man, Two Governors. And I didn't know that. Really, really, really funny. Yeah. What about we had this final victory tour, the goodbye tour for David Letterman? Were you a, a Letterman acolyte? Or? Oh, I always watched him. I thought Letterman filled in an, a place that nobody was filling in. He was a, well, he was. You know, the, the things that the people are now f missing him because that, that truth that he ha had was a strange... And by the way, I'll never forget him. He made one of the most brilliant speeches, or not a speech, yeah. but a, a, a lecture about 9-11. Yeah, when he came That back. was that the extent of intelligence in his brain. By the way, I look for Colbert coming back to do the Letterman show. I heard Colbert... Want, What's his first name? Stephen. Stephen Colbert, doing an interview about his wife and his kids, and yeah. his, I said, "This is the dearest human being I've ever heard," yeah. and I can't wait to see. He's not going to be the, the crazy, foolish person he was there, yeah. but I can't wait to see that. Well, you have a reputation as being one of the nice comedians. You know, you don't, you're a happy comedian. Yes, you're I not am. like this angst-filled, anger, no. unhappy guy. No, Colbert seems to be the same way. Yes, he is. Now, you also uh, a tweet about politics. Yes, I noticed this one. Let's uh, let's show this tweet that you put up not that long ago. At 93. You're hoping to be around for the next national election so that you can cast your vote for our first woman president. So, now look, read, read that. Something that you prophesized three years ago. Yes, in one of these books. One of the books, we could find it. You find it. But I think you're actually, what, talking about Carly Fiorina, right? No, 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 no. Not Carly Fiorina? No, no, this, this is very interesting. I, for, I think it's that book. Yeah. In, in, in this book, I, I, I talk about a family... Uh, a, a, a particular family and, and what happens in the world after that, what the family does in that world. And the year 20 so and so, uh, tw uh, 30, and uh, the year uh, 20, uh, I mean, what is it, 1987? Right. 19, uh, Carla Forino, uh, not Forino, uh, Eva Longoria, so Sanchez Basset becomes the second woman president. Right. And a nice a little asterisk, the first woman president is. Is Hillary Clinton, and this was three, four years ago. Right. I sent it to Hillary, and she said, "If this happens, you'll get the first dance at the ball." Now, the interesting thing, I put a picture in the book. I put a picture in the book of. I found a picture of Hillary Clinton shaking hands with Barack Obama, and and Bill Clinton is there, and I said, the incoming president saying goodbye to the outgoing president while the fir first man looks on. And that's what you predicted three years ago. Three years ago. So not only are you uh, a, a great tweeter, a great writer, a great writer, you're prescient. Yes. You're the, you're yes. the Jewish Nostradamus. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> well, actually, actually, Mel is, but I, I learned from him. Ladies and gentlemen, Carl Reiner. <laughs> Stay here for a second. Stay right here for a second. Yes. Uh, you can get you can get all of Carl's books oh. at, at 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 randomcontent.com where Carl will personally personalize your book but before you go order it uh, please check out this video our latest Dickopedia. <laughs>
Dickopedia, a wiki of dicks. Today's entry, Bikram Chowdhury. Bikram Chowdhury is a 69-year-old yoga instructor, a multi-millionaire businessman, and a dick. The originator of hot yoga, featuring classes held in sweltering conditions, Chowdhury first staked his claim to dickhood in 2002 when he attempted to copyright his sequence of 26 postures, a cynical appropriation of Hindu spiritual practice that's been compared to trying to copyright the Lord's Prayer. Having built a yoga empire that includes schools in over 200 countries, Chowdhury dickishly flaunts his wealth. He owns a fleet of 40 luxury cars and often leads his classes wearing nothing but a tiny Speedo and a $1 million diamond and ruby encrusted watch. Chowdhury's dick moves extend to his ego. He regularly compares himself to Jesus and Buddha, neither of whom is known to have said, as Bikram did, I have balls like atom bombs, two of them, 100 megatons each. Nobody fucks with me. But his dickest boasts go far beyond the explosive power of his testicles. His claims that he healed Janet Reno's Parkinson's and Richard Nixon's phlebitis are wholly unsubstantiated, as is his assertion that his yoga can cure, well, just about anything. I totally cure you, whatever the problem you have. Even less credible is his contention that he worked with the Beatles in 1959, since he would have been 13 at the time and, more importantly, the group had not yet been formed. Nowhere is Chowdhury's dick behavior more evident than during the teacher training programs he holds twice a year. After paying over $14,000, attendees are forced to endure nine weeks of grueling physical exertion, restricted food and water, and supervisors who won't let them go to the bathroom without permission. Trainees are also required to stay up late into the night watching Hindi-language Bollywood movies that have nothing to do with yoga. Films Chowdhury cheerfully narrates while having his shoulders massaged and his hair brushed by attractive young wannabe Bikram instructors. These women are often groped and subjected to dicky Bikram pickup lines like, If I don't have sex, I will die. You are saving my life. According to a series of civil lawsuits, Chowdhury's carnal come on sometimes lead to sexual assaults. He put his hand inside my leg, and then I said, please don't. He raped me. One former Bikram trainee alleges that while she was pleading for him to stop, the aroused yoga guru penetrated her, ejaculated quickly, then asked, how many times did you come? Bikram denies the multiple charges, going so far as to portray himself as the one being pressured, explaining, if a follower says to me, boss, you must fuck me or I will kill myself. Think if I don't, the karma. Add to this mix a collection of sexist, racist, and homophobic comments, and you don't need to bend over backwards or break a sweat to reach the conclusion that Bikram Chowdhury is an utterly detestable dick. I'm the most spiritual man you ever met. Very deserving of a Dickopedia entry. All right, it's time for our panel. Our first panelist was a member of one of the most beloved hip hop groups of all time, the Fugees. Yeah. yeah. And he has just released his second documentary, Sweet Mickey for President, which is a look at the winning campaign of current Haitian leader Michel Martelly. Please welcome Praz Michel. Our second panelist is a stand-up comedian and actress who played Donna Meagle on the already-missed TV show Parks and Rec. Please hear it, Retta. Yeah. Thank you guys for being here. Really appreciate it. Now, there were a lot of compelling stories grabbing the interest of HuffPost readers this week, including presidential candidate-in-waiting Scott Walker taking mansplaining to a whole new level when he uh, defended a law that he had signed forcing women who want to have an abortion to have an invasive transvaginal ultrasound, saying that it was just a cool thing for women to have. <laughs> now, Retta, uh, Praz, I think we're probably uh, not, we haven't gone to the OBGYN, right? Uh, so as the only one here who has gone to an OBGYN, do you think an invasive transvaginal uh, uh, ultrasound is a cool thing? Yeah, if you're a freak, but... <laughs> I mean, I don't like going to the gynecologist. You have to, you need to, but it's not fun. Yeah, not the definition you know, of fun. You know, but why is it that whenever we, or we meaning men, 
uh, talk about these things, that we try to frame it as it's a cool thing, uh, it's a good thing, it's a good thing for you. I don't know, you tell me. <laughs> You're a dude, why do you frame it that way? Yeah. <laughs> because we want to control and keep you down because yes. you're more powerful. Oh, there you go. All right, well, I'll accept that. Okay. <laughs> now, 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 Pras, it seems like whenever we talk about women's health or women's bodies, it, it's never in a serious way. It's always in related to some ridiculous comment like this or, or Todd Akin, you know, with the legitimate rape. Uh, do you think when it comes to, to women's bodies and women's health, men should just shut the fuck up? I yes. would agree, yes. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, because it's interesting. They always try to frame it this way. I mean, he, he, he literally compared this to uh, grandparents showing pictures on their iPhone. Yeah, because that's what women want to do. They want to have a memory of something that was, you know, terrible or was not fun and put it in their wallet or on their phone yeah. to show their friends. What Instagram uh, filter would you use for that? Is that Valencia for the boarded fetus? Uh... I don't know, but you'd post it on Throwback Thursday. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Now, talking about this, though, this is always the way that they try to frame it, as if something's fun or interesting. I think it's interesting that they're always looking for ways, since they can't overturn Roe v. Wade, right? It's, well, you have to wait two days. You have to watch a video. You have to have an ultrasound. But really, at the end of the day, it's really just trying to control women's bodies, right? Yeah. I feel like they think that they're going to just a little more time and she'll fall in love with it, where it, that's... That's never the case. I mean, may maybe it happens, but chances are they're doing it for a reason. And, and two more hours isn't going to change the reason why they're, they're having the procedure. So Now, now this, this, this came up in 2012, and it was the GOP's war on women, uh, and it helped get Barack Obama elected. Uh, have they learned nothing? You know, I, to be honest with you, this conversation, I'm so confused. <laughs> Uh, no, I am, because I'm confused because I don't understand what the GOP are trying to do. Are they trying not to win the election? I mean, I don't get it. But I'm really baffled. I really don't get it. <laughs> I don't get it. Yeah. I'm trying to make sense out of it. I'm not even trying to be funny. I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm trying to think, what can I say that could sound somewhat profound, but I just don't get it. I really don't. I think that's the thing. As we look at this field of ever-increasing GOP candidates for president, is there anybody coming through that seems to be making sense? Because isn't the whole purpose is to get votes, right? <laughs> Theoretically, yes. This is why. <laughs> yes. And more, more women are voters than men, right? <laughs> so wouldn't it be safe to say, hey, listen, I might be pro-life, but, you know, you make your own decision on what you want to do, even though if you don't really mean it, but to say it so you can at least get the vote. <laughs> at least be a smart politician. Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Now, on the other side of the ledger, uh, <laughs> the there's the discussion you, going on, you know, in, in the culture about what defines a man, manhood, what makes somebody a man. Uh, obviously, not just a male, but a man. And Fox and Friends, that uh, deep, incisive show uh, over on Fox, had a, had a segment this week in which they had an expert came on to say what it means to be a man. And his theory was that you need to know how to tie a knot, tie a tie, and change a car tire. So to prove this, they went out and this is what happened. So what's important here that you guys understand is that okay, Brian, being a man is not about what you are, it's about who you are. Okay, so in what respect, in what respect? What these guys right now happen to be helping someone who's in distress. This is what a man does, not just a male. I love Whoa, that. watch it, hold, hold what you got. No, 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 stop no, what you're no, doing. No, 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 Jack's Let it down. There's Jack's a little bit of teamwork falling. going on right this here. This is amazing. <laughs> this is amazing. Now, you have a son. Uh, what, all kidding aside, what would you want to impart to him? What does it mean to be a man in your eyes? I mean, the way I was raised in my household um, is about taking care of your responsibilities, respecting women. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, um, my sister and I got into an argument, and I told her, shut up. And my dad came to me, smacked me, and told me, you have to always be respectful to a woman. So to me, being a man is being respectful and taking care of your responsibility. I know how to change a tire, but that doesn't mean that I'm a man, you know? So I think that when you have these, you know, when you have these ultra conservatives, you know, think they know what's best for all of us, like someone left them and 
left them in charge of the world or whatever. And then they get on a TV show, can't even change a, cha uh, a tire. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we showed it, yeah. <laughs> now, Retta, what do you, for you, what defines, you know, makes somebody a man and, and not just a male? Well, according to Fox and Friends, I'm a man because I can tie a knot, tie a tie, <laughs> and change a tire. So... <laughs> I have those capabilities. I... I don't know what makes a man. I think being... Just being true to yourself and, and not trying to check off a checklist you know, to, to, to prove who you are. Just, just be authentic and true to yourself, and, and everybody will get it. You know yeah. what I mean? You don't have to try so hard. Yeah. I mean, did you see that thing? There was also the thing where this guy was crying at his wedding, uh, on, and, and people on Twitter were saying, oh, he was crying because he realized he was never going to be able to have other women. And, 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 he wrote, and he wrote back, he's like, no, it's because I saw my wife, uh, you know, for the first time in, in, in her gown, and that's why I was crying. Uh, why do we still have this issue in 2015 about men being able to cry, express emotions? I mean, I guess it started back during the caveman time, right? Because <laughs> the man would go and hunt and the woman stays back, you know? But, I mean, cut to 2015, the social media aspect, you know, you, it's putting a lot of pressure on people, especially Instagram, <laughs> right? It's put a lot of pressure on people. So, I mean, I, I mean, I, look... The guy was in love, he saw his wife, he cried. I, mean, I don't think he cried because he can't get any more women because he's stuck. I don't know if that was the case. I think it was love. When was the last time you cried? At my father's funeral. Seems like an appropriate right. use of emotion <laughs> there. Yeah. How about you? Uh, when I got my lip waxed. <laughs> <laughs> it always makes me cry. <laughs> I still can't get used to it. <laughs> Every other month, I cry. Do you scream? No, I try not to because I feel like my lady judges me. So take it as she, yeah. take it as a man. Exactly. She. I feel like she has like an issue with me. It's like relax. It happens all the time. So I like. I just and a little, you know. <laughs> one. Just yeah. One sad tear. That's what sad tear. Okay, let's look at our next story. Uh, Cameron Crowe's new rom-com movie, Aloha, starring Bradley Cooper and Emma Stone, is being accused of whitewashing Hawaii. In other words, being another film set on an island whose majority population is a minority, but that features white people. <laughs> and although, it's funny, they tried to play this one off by saying that Emma Stone, who maybe is one of the whitest people that you could ever see, <laughs> she's one quarter, her character is one quarter uh, Pacific Islander. Mm -hmm. And they name her Aang. Now, of course, this isn't the first time Hollywood has a long tradition of uh, white people playing Asians. Uh, Mickey Rooney, uh, if you remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Breakfast yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, my God. <laughs> and then we had, of course, Marlon Brando, Tiasa the August Moon, and the most American of all, the Duke, John Wayne as, yes, Genghis Khan. <laughs> so here's, here's my question. I mean, we talk a lot about diversity. We talk about diversity in casting. Uh, but here's roles that are meant for Asians, and they're even giving white people those roles. You're, making, you're starting to make films. You're working in films. Why do you think this is? Is it just because that's where the money, the money people, if you go to the halls, if you go to the people who at the studios, they're mostly white? I think it goes back to how you started your, um, this whole conversation. You have a group of people who think they know what we want to see. So they make movies, they think middle America is going to pay the tickets, want to see all white. But what they don't understand, there's a reason why a movie like Exodus didn't win at the box office, and it's the reason why this is not going to win at the box office. <laughs> it's because people want to see something that's real. They, they don't necessarily want to see them all the time. They want it to be authentic. So it goes back to that classic saying, you can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all the yeah. people all the time. Yeah. 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 Now, I, I find it interesting that when it comes to diversity, it seems that TV is way ahead of the movies. Uh, you know, we have all these... Now. Uh, uh, yeah, finally. Now. I mean, we have this blackish, right, uh, fresh off the boat, uh, how to get away with murder, scandal, etc. Um, do you find this... Empire. When you're go Empire. Yeah. What? The jam. Yes? It's the jam. It is the jam? <laughs> yeah. Is Cookie your girl? Oh, Cookie is life. Cookie is life. <laughs> yes. Now, when you went in for uh, the role on Parks and Rec, 
Was that written for a, a black actress, or was it uh, race neutral and you took the role? I, I don't know, but now that I think about the the waiting room, there were some black actresses. It wasn't all black actresses, but then again, I don't know what everybody was going in for. Um, but I don't remember reading the description saying black. I don't remember that. Yeah. Um, and I don't necessarily feel that th as the character went on that they were pressed to make her, you know, black, so black, you know what I mean? We, she just had her experiences, and, you know, she dated white guys. Well, dated. She slept with <laughs> everyone. Um, everyone? Yeah, she slept with yeah. everybody. Yeah, yeah. She's equal opportunity. Bring it. Yeah. So, <laughs> which I feel like that's just life these days. It's, it's, Bringing it? Yeah, yeah uh, with everyone. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm married 22 years. Am I missing something? Yeah. Sorry, honey. <laughs> Are you, yeah, My wife's out there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm missing a lot. Yeah, yeah. I'm missing I feel everybody. Like, bring it. I, I, I mean, we're everyone's. It's mixing. Things are mixing. You know, it's 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 working its way towards a gray culture. Um, yeah. I don't think it's so white, black, blah blah blah. You yeah. know, everybody's hitting everybody. <laughs> On the Tinder and the and the grinder. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting though that even when they try to get it right. Some people get upset, you know, I don't know, Michael B. Jordan, great actor, uh, he's gonna be playing the Human Torch right. in the Fantastic Four, who in the comic book was not black. So all the fanboys are, oh, it's, we can't be a black guy, that's not right. Do you think it's just because we have this conception in our mind of a certain kind of character? You know, Christian Grey looks a certain way, Katniss looks a certain way, do they, is that why they're upset or do you think it's just flat out racism? I, uh, it's it's racism because the same thing happened with with the little girl that played Rue, where the writer described her as a dark skinned character, and people were up in arms that Rue was black, and they said they were broken when Rue died in the book, but because she was black in the movie, it didn't hurt him so much. That's racism. <laughs> You're a hater. You're a straight hater, and and that sort of thing is. That's some inherent nonsense, and it has nothing to do with the fact that the character has changed. You are a hater, and that's why. Now, a as a dad, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Roz, as a dad, is it, is it important for you, for your son, to be able to see that kind of character, a superhero, uh, a black superhero? Uh, I mean, yeah, but I think it's about... You know, um, listen, before they were black characters, I think black kids that were watching TVs in the 50s and the 60s, they still emulated and wanted to be the next Superman or Batman. Now, obviously, I think moving into a world that's more inclusive now, it only makes sense to add a black character here and there. I mean, we didn't get upset when they did Moses and there were no black people in the movies in the 50s and the 60s, so why are they getting upset because one black character out of four, I mean, all, one character out of the four characters are black? I mean, I, I, I think it's just nonsense. It's just theatrics. Because when they go see the movie, it's either the movie's good or it's not. Right. It doesn't matter if it's black or white. It's like you were saying, Empire is the biggest hit of the season. It's not just black people watching it. Yeah, they sprinkle some white people in there, but... Yeah. <laughs> But are, they the, are they the bad guys, though? No. Oh, well, well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. They were? One guy is, the one guy. Oh, one guy's bad. Well. You know, like... <laughs> now, I, I, it'd, be, it'd be terrible for me to have you here and not ask you a couple questions about uh, the projects you have going. Your new film, uh, Sweet Mickey, you actually are the one who convinced them to run, right? Yeah. Tell us about that. How, how did you sort of impact international politics, Fraz? Well, for those who don't know, so after the earthquake in 2010 in Haiti, um, I wanted to do something. Um, I went to a friend of mine named Sweet Mickey, a.k.a. Michelle Martelli. He was a very popular musician in Haiti, kind of like the Michael Jackson of Haiti, but I didn't realize that he used to wear diapers on stage, thongs, moon the stage. So I tapped him and said, listen, I think you should run for president of Haiti. And I'm been known to us, he won. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's, so you go through the, you know, it's, it's the stories about this guy going from being a diaper man to becoming a statesman, basically. Diaper man to statesman? Yeah. So instead of Hillary Clinton, we can get George Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Bring it. Flashlight, baby. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, now, what happened in the middle of the campaign when you found out that, in the campaign, that Wycliffe 
has decided that he was going to run for president as well. Yeah, that was a bombshell. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, because he's the biggest Haitian international superstar. So he came in and, um, you know, we were that little train that just could. Wyclef came in with $20 million just to register. We had $17,000, you know. But luckily for us, he got disqualified. <laughs> <laughs> Did it piss you off, though, when he, when he threw his head into the ring? No, I didn't, because actually he helped us because his weight was so huge. Then everyone made it ex-bandmate not supporting Wyclef, which helped Michelle Martelli to get some international um, coverage. But you see all in the movie. It's, it's, a, it's like a political thriller. It's real funny. It's not a conventional talking head documentary. So I hope everybody go out and check it out. And now, now, Retta, you, your character and yourself have started this, uh, this movement Treat Yourself. <laughs> now, what, what is the essence of Treat Yourself? It's basically do what makes you feel good. Take the time to do for you. For me, it's buying handbags. Mm. <laughs> treat Yourself. <laughs> yes, I treat myself to handbags. That's fantastic. <laughs> now, uh, since you got him elected president of Haiti, last question, do you have anybody that you're uh, backing in 2016? Well, by default, not by default, but, um, you know, I'm... I'm a big Obama supporter and a friend, and so I want to see history be made again. I want to see the first woman president so she can tell all the men, stop telling us what to do with <laughs> themselves, you know? So. Yeah. <laughs> Join me in thanking them for joining us on the panel, guys. Thank you very much. Uh, make, sure, make sure you check out Plaza's new film, Sweet Nikki, for president at the L.A. Film Festival on June 11th. And special thanks, because he just flew in from New Zealand uh, to be on the show tonight. I really appreciate that. And you've got to follow Retta on Twitter. You are a badass tweeter. Thank you. She's one of the biggest live tweeters I've ever seen. You're like... Uh, Spelling bee last night. Oh, she was tweeting that. It's absurd. <laughs> so you guys sit here for a second. And uh, listen, a lot of TV networks are currently rolling out their new summer shows. Here's a preview for one you won't be able to miss even if you want to. This week, millions of Americans tuned in to the seven-day quiz show event, 500 Questions. Now it's time to kick it up a notch. You are about to witness television history. Get ready for an 18-month event showcasing the finest the Republican Party has to offer with contestants with degrees from Harvard, Brown, and a handful of semesters at Marquette in a battle of wits that pits career politicians against ophthalmologists, brain surgeons, ordained ministers, and former tech company CEOs. They're all competing for the ultimate prize, an upscale address and the title of leader of the free world. And all they have to do is answer just one question. On the subject of Iraq, knowing what we know now, would you have authorized the invasion? I don't understand the question you're asking. If I know uh, now, then what I know... Uh... No saves. I don't think it's productive to play hypothetical uh, game. No phone a speechwriter. Well, I don't want to second guess. And absolutely... I would have. Positively... I would have not. No takesies, backsies. Whatever I heard, it was translated. Knowing what you knew then, what would you do? Um, I... So what was the question? It's just one question. You'd think they would have uh, had a little time to think about it before they go in there. Anyway, before we go, we want to do our part to make your weekend a little bit better by helping ensure that you're well prepared and able to be part of any conversation. So we're going to do a quick lightning round of party prep, checking out the HuffPost, and giving you a ready-made take that you can use should any of these stories come up this weekend. Okay, our first headline. FIFA red card. Fourteen top soccer officials were arrested in a $150 million bribery scheme involving marketing firms landing exclusive TV contracts. If this comes up at a party, you say, you see, this proves what I've said all along. When it comes to soccer, even the corruption is boring. <laughs> Next up, Lilo Unchained. For the first time in nearly eight years, Lindsay Lohan is officially not on probation. 
Sadly, her movie career remains on death row. <laughs> Next up, swipe right, swab left. A Rhode Island Department of Health study blames hookup apps like Tinder and Grindr for the recent increase in STDs. <laughs> I'm waiting for someone to invent an app that handles the entire hookup process in one transaction. You order an Uber, it delivers you someone you met on Tinder who you have sex with in the back seat while driving to a clinic that's accepting Groupons for half off all penicillin shots. And finally, Far East failure. A new report estimates that roughly 8,000 Chinese students were expelled from American universities last year for cheating or bad grades. This is a great day for the destruction of racial stereotypes. No longer will entire classrooms feel the need to try and cheat off the Asian kid. Okay. <laughs> Come on, that's the truth, you know it. Sometimes stereotypes are because you know they're right. Anyway, those were our takes, and we'd love to hear any of yours. Just tweet them with the hashtag HPShowTakes, and be sure to follow us on Twitter and Instagram, like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and here's where I usually make a Tinder joke, but after that STD story, I think I'm gonna skip it this time. So just join me in thanking Carl Reiner, Praz Michel, Rena, along with Mike Huckabee, Rick Santorum, Bikram Chowdhury, all 21 of the Duggars, and every newsmaker who made this such an amazing week. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Hey, thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click here for more videos. And make sure to catch new episodes Friday at 9 p.m. on HuffingtonPost.com.